reading. Okay, the books floating by themselves is unsettling. But not only do those floaty motherfuckers make no noise when they land at their destination, there's also ample space for them to land on the opposite shelf, even though we see the rest of these shelves are pretty much packed. So while it is kind of weird, it's also completely nonsensical and unnecessary. Kind of like, well, libraries. Dastardly disorganization of the Dewey Decimal Drawers devastates discovery of Dianetics. Also, I thought the ghost here was supposed to be a former librarian. So I guess it kind of makes sense that she's been sorting books and stuff, even though that was lame. But why would she f*** this hard with the card catalog? Is the main issue that's preventing her from moving into the afterlife her long-standing beef with the LC? <laughs> so what happened to her? Did she die? Did anything of consequence happen? Well, no. The librarian is totally fine the next time we see her. Square. Good guess, but wrong. Bill Murray, of course, is wonderful in this movie. Gets tons of laughs, but I'm wondering how Columbia University saw fit to hire this guy for any position, considering he doesn't seem to be an academic of any kind. Maybe because his friends are respected in the f***ing what? Paranormal Studies Division? Okay, I guess their academic standards and hiring policies aren't strict at all. Figure eight. Incredible. It's five for five. Why doesn't anyone want to see the card flipped? I know if I was somehow getting these right, I'd want to see it for myself. But nobody even bothers to ask Venkman to flip the card. A couple of wavy lines. Sorry, this isn't your lucky day. Is this A, an actual experiment to see if negative reinforcement would affect this kid's ESP? B, Peter being introduced as a sadist. C, Peter being introduced as a horny sadist. D, a spicy Albanian cola drink. Or E, all of the above. You may as well get used to that. Conducting bogus experiments to sleep with students. You guys have been running your ass off, meeting and greeting every schizo in the five bros who says he has a paranormal experience. What have you seen? Isn't Bankman part of this research team too? I understand he's more into ESP and being pervy to female students, but are ghosts seriously a non-starter for him? Since when did this asshole become a skeptic? You got this reminds me of the time you tried to drill a hole through your head. Do you remember that? That would have worked if you hadn't stopped me. First off, how the hell does this situation remind Peter of the head hole drilling incident? And second off, even though Egon is eccentric, why would he have tried to drill a f***ing hole in his head? And third, if he still believes it could have worked, why didn't he keep trying it? Symmetrical book stacking, just like the Philadelphia Man's Turbulence of 1947. I understand a ghost haunting in a library would do something super f***ed up like stack books floor to ceiling, but if the book stacking in Philadelphia was that notable, mass turbulence sounds way too vague and book stacking should be way more common than an isolated incident 37 years ago. You're right, no human being would stack books like this. Why didn't we see the books being stacked like this during the opening scene? We saw all the other ghostly malfeasance, right? This would be much more terrifying than, like, watching those f***ing books float to a different shelf. Talk about telekinetic activity, look at this mess! Then why wasn't this all over the books that were stacked in the stacks? It's here. Earlier, Ray told Peter that ten people witnessed this apparition, but it's apparently been chilling in the same lonely part of the building that the librarian was wandering around in the beginning of the movie, when there was nobody else around. Since the main floor of the library is still business as usual, and there's only a small section of the building where anything like the book stacking occurred, how did ten people see this ghost? You'd expect to see more damage in book stacking if that was the case. Get her! I understand that this is hilarious. I'm not completely devoid of a sense of humor. I laughed my ass off at that Chris Angel show a couple years ago, but I don't understand why they think they need to interact with the ghost. Documenting it is perfectly fine. You might even get some funding out of it. But what was the end game if they grabbed this ghost? I trust you're moving us to better quarters on campus. No, you're being moved off campus. This dean saw what Bob Ursay did to the Baltimore Colts earlier in the year and decided it was the perfect method to get these assholes out of their current digs. You're not going to lose the house. Everybody has three mortgages nowadays. But at 19%, you didn't even bargain with the guy. It's laughable they let Peter negotiate this mortgage deal on Ray's house. It's even more laughable that Peter, who is clearly a con man, didn't try to get a better deal. Hey, does this poll still work? Asking if a poll still works when it's not a machine and you're not my college girlfriend. Wow, this place is great. When can we move in? Ray was worried about the triple mortgage in the previous scene and was upset that Peter didn't even negotiate a better interest rate. Meanwhile, Egon just laid out all the reasons not to buy this place, but then they buy it because of a freaking fire pole. <laughs> Jaywalking. I thought we were supposed to like Dana, but she's clearly a serial criminal. What kind of apartment building is this that you can somehow lock yourself out of your own room? I'd understand if he somehow opened the door and locked the latch on the knob as he went out, but he didn't do that. Are you troubled by strange noises in the middle of the night? How long has it been since these guys were evicted from Columbia? They've had time to move into the new place, mostly fix it up, create a business plan, film a commercial, and get wide distribution on a network in New York City? That must have taken at least six months or so, right? But we get no sense of the passing of time within the first 20 minutes of this movie. Lewis told Dana that the TV magically came on while she was gone, and luckily it did, because 
because it just happens to be on the Ghostbusters commercial, and she's going to experience some ghostly shit right after this. Marshadowing. Why does Zool need to fuck up Dana's groceries? Is this all part of the weakening of a human host before the possession? Because, you know, it could have turned the TV on while she was in her apartment instead of while she was away. Or fucked up whatever's going on with that fruit basket instead of destroying those delicious eggs. Investigating the growling coming from your refrigerator. Janine any calls. The Ghostbusters have no revenue, customers, or current jobs to keep them occupied. But they decided not only to go ahead and hire a goddamn receptionist, they already paid for her personalized nameplate for her desk? Why does Dana go to the Ghostbusters headquarters instead of just calling the number she saw on the ad a few minutes ago? And this voice said, Zool. Dana knows for sure that the demon dog said Zool, even though it growled something pretty goddamn unintelligible and she was in the throes of panic and terror. How did she get the name correct on the first try? It could have said drool or spool or even just boo. Well, I could go to Hall of Records and check out the structural details in the building. I could look for the name Zool in the usual literature. Which is what they do, and they find tons of stuff. But Dana, who's been away from her apartment for the last two days, inexplicably goes back to live there while they figure it out. And she gets possessed by the demon dog. But hey, if they don't drag their feet on the research, the movie can't happen. That would be a bummer, but... I'm giving you the sin anyway. Okay, who's the asshole here? Is it Ray, who sat right in the middle of this love seat, even though there are three other people in the room? Or is it Egon, who sidled up right next to him and stuck his nerdy ass on the side cushion without any warning, despite there being multiple seating options in this area? Or is it this completely unnecessary lamp on the end table that is putting out so little relative light that it might as well be a black hole? Sure, they find out that Dana's apartment is located in a building labeled Spook Central later, but one thing no one has considered is maybe she invited this sh into her place by having a severed hand on her end table and a disembodied head with a top hat on her piano. No kiss. <laughs> you remember how hilarious casual sexual harassment was back in the 80s? Especially concerning a contractor you've hired to come to your own apartment to investigate a terrifying ordeal? <laughs> and of course they end up together. Wow, they got this car humming in no time. Remember when Dana walked in earlier? Ray was working on it just seconds after telling Peter that it needed, well, everything fixed. Then Peter goes to inspect Dana's apartment that same day. Here, they're celebrating their first customer, which only psychos would do weeks afterwards, which is exactly how much time would have been required to fix and paint that car. Obviously sped up footage is obviously sped up. What are you supposed to be, some kind of a cosmonaut? That's Russist. You know, it's just occurred to me we really haven't had a completely successful test of this equipment. Do you know what just occurred to me? You left the New York Public Library in the lurch and they still have that ghost running around that you never took care of. Why didn't you practice your equipment at the library? Sure, you probably would have destroyed some rare books, but anytime you can prevent people from reading, that's a good thing. Given how prominent this sign is, I think I can safely assume the real villain of this movie is the motherfucker who was just attempting to board the elevator a few minutes ago with a fully lit cigar. <laughs> I see the Ghostbusters and the NYPD have something in common. Beckman? Beckman! We find out later they have radios, so why doesn't Ray use that to call Peter right now? How does this not burn the whole building down? Or at least start a medium-sized fire on the 12th floor? It's right here, Ray. If Slimer can easily transport through walls and sh**, why is he even here in the hallway? Especially poised for a confrontation with Peter. If it senses danger, why doesn't that f**ko either hightail it into room 433 or attack as soon as it sees the dude with the proton pack? He slimed me. Great line, for sure, but it also inspired far too much content on Nickelodeon for the next 40 years or so. Get down here right away, it just went into a ballroom. How the f*** does Egon know it went into a ballroom? Wasn't he on the 12th floor with the others? Just in a different section? The last time we saw him, he was using a PKE meter on this dude. Meanwhile, the ghost who will be known as Slimer, just Slime Peter. How the hell is Egon already updated on Slimer's whereabouts? Both Ray and Peter saw this little bastard with the naked eyes. So why does Ray need these fancy-ass goggles to track Slimer down in the ballroom? I'm fuzzy on the whole good-bad thing. What do you mean, bad? Bill Murray predicts his response to the cameo request in the 2016 remake of this franchise. I need some room to put the trap down! Give me some room! You're just now putting down the trap? What the hell have you been trying to do this whole time, then? Vaporize the ghost? You've got him! Don't cross the street! But aren't there streams technically crossing each other as they pull Slimer down? Don't look directly into the trap! I looked at the trap, Ray! But weirdly enough, this will never come up again. And Egon will face fewer repercussions than the drug dealer to the set of this movie. Well, that wasn't such a chore, now, was it? Canadians. Today, the entire eastern seaboard is alive with talk of incidents of paranormal activity. The entire eastern seaboard? And that sh just came up after the busters trapped that one slimy fuck in the hotel? Remember, the ghost had been around for a while. The hotel manager mentioned the staff knew about Slimer long before this. So it's not like the impending arrival of Gozer is making the whole East Coast suddenly turn into the Hellmouth in Sunnydale. While this newspaper is blurry, it is clearly about politics and not about ghost fever. Why are these assholes running on the sidewalk? Are they patrolling? I thought they got called and went to a specific location. What happens if they find the ghost outside? Do they have the authority to clear the streets and make sure nobody gets a stream in their face? Ray dreams about this beautiful lady ghost who comes to him in the night to give him a BJ and a phantasmic orgasm. 
But why does she disappear? Anyway, I'm sure when Ray wakes up, he'll realize he's had a white dream. Do you believe in UFOs, astral projections? Why is Janine interviewing potential candidates for this job instead of one of the Ghostbusters? I don't care how devil may care their approach. Don't they need to properly vet a person that's going to wield a nuclear weapon with regularity? This is Winston Zedmore. He's here about the job. Beautiful, you're hired. Look, I like Winston as much as anyone else, but this is a now world-famous ghost-busting company. How are there not lines of people wanting to take this on? And as busy as they are, why not have a whole other team, rather than just hiring one more person? You have some information for me on my case? You mean to tell me that after all this time, Zool hasn't done any more shit in Dana's apartment? Is this a spirit deciding to lay low after it nearly got caught? The name Zool refers to a demigod worshipped around 6,000 BC by the... Seriously, all I have is what amounts to a Wikipedia entry on Zool and Ghost. I know they got busy and famous, but you'd think at least one of them would have fully researched this demon already. Well, what does he do? Well, he's a scientist. I know this guy is a world-class musician. He probably studies his craft all hours of the day, but how the f*** has he not seen Peter's face on commercials, magazines, newspapers, and news segments on TV? And Dana, why the f*** would she be so vague as to say Peter is a scientist? Why can't she just say Ghostbuster, since you're clearly not crazy anymore if you talk about the existence of ghosts? You go get a court order, and I'll sue your ass for wrongful prosecution. What in the f***? is Peter talking about? A court order isn't prosecuting anybody. It would just be an order for Walter to look at the storage facility. Maybe it's some sort of empty threat? I've never understood this response from Peter. It's not even a joke. Let's say this Twinkie represents the normal amount of psychokinetic energy in the New York area. Excellent visual aid, but how is there an unwrapped, fully intact Twinkie lying conveniently on this desk right now? A Twinkie lives in only two states, wrapped or ingested. I don't care how laissez-faire those dick poles are. There's no way that f***ing snack spends more than 0.7 seconds in an ambient environment. You may think this is the beginning of the supernatural apocalypse, but it's really just the movie's indictment on the effect of the air quality in New York City on their most beloved outdoor sculptures. It's Lewis! Somebody let me out! If the doors to this building are so noise resistant, how did Lewis hear Dana's TV turned up so loudly earlier in the movie? Hell, even if it's because he was stalking her apartment, you could clearly hear the music coming out of his pad during her walk through the hall a few seconds ago. Classic demon diversion. Get the victim to look one way, then BAM! Surprise them from the chair you were hiding in the whole time. Wait, what? These demon dick dogs are not only demon dicks, they're also pervious Couldn't they have just grabbed her when she walked into the door? There have got to be better ways to possess humans than what we just saw. Ted has a small carpet cleaning business in receivership. Annette's drawing a salary from a deferred bonus from two years ago. Rick Moranis is ad-libbing this entire thing about Ted and Annette, and it's f***ing glorious. So did Lewis have any strange things happening in his apartment before the demon dog showed up? I guess something could have happened and he never called the Ghostbusters because he's cheap or something, but it really feels like the movie is saying this is the first paranormal activity that's occurred here. Ah yes, running into Central Park at night in the 1980s New York. Definitely the best place to evade imminent danger. I'm gonna bring us up at the next tenants meeting. There's not supposed to be any pets in the building. Dude, the dog was in your apartment and you only had clients at the party. Now, some of your clients might live in the building, but if you somehow missed one of them bringing in a demon dog, that's on you, man. <laughs> Apathy on the green. Anyway, how do they miss seeing the demon dog? Lewis isn't nearly big enough to block their view, and he ends up crumpling to the ground anyway. Are you the key master? Why doesn't she know the answer to this question? You want this body? Why the shit are these ghosts so goddamn horny all of a sudden? Doesn't Zool have a job to do before Gozer shows up? It's only like a couple hours away. There is no Dana, only Zool. What a lovely singing voice you must have. <laughs> okay, this movie broke me. I can't help but adore the bonkers performance of Sigourney Weaver and the unflappable humor from Bill Murray. Blast one sin back to the other dimension with a proton ray, damn it! Why the f is Zool levitating Dana's body right now? What does this do? Vince Clortho, key master of Gozer. I don't know why these demon dogs had to possess humans to summon Gozer, but even if they did, why didn't they coordinate this shit better before they did all the possessing? Hey, I'm gonna be inside the nerdy dude. Cool, I'm taking this tall chick from across the hall. Let's meet up around midnight at the soda machine. Meanwhile, Zool set an elaborate trap for Dana, while the other one didn't do dick, and that's why Lewis is talking to a horse right now. We picked up this guy, now we don't know what to do with him. Put him in jail? I mean, what makes him so special in the sea of crazy people you pick up in New York every night? What makes you certain ghosts are involved? Bellevue doesn't want him, and I'm afraid to put him in the lockup. You mean a psychiatric hospital won't take a guy who's acting like Lewis? And are you telling me you don't have a solitary holding cell to put him in? What has he done that's so unusual that you can't put him anywhere? Vince Lewis got all sassy and growly with the f carriage boss a few seconds ago after a casual encounter, but he let Egon put all this shit on him for analysis without any issues? I just whacked her up with about 300 cc's of bars. Um, Peter was carrying a syringe of antipsychotic sedative in his pocket on a date? I think we really gotta think about who the real evil bastard in this movie is. And the moon became his blood. 
the seas boiled and the skies fell. Training for a Bible quiz tournament while on the clock. I'm not interested in your opinion, just shut it off. It's weird to me that the court order allows Walter to shut down the containment unit without an inspection first. Earlier, when he was talking to Peter, the threat was to get a court order to inspect the facility. Now he's got a full-blown shut-it-down order without any reason. In a world where the majority of people now believe in ghosts, why would a judge or even a volatile EPA representative be this committed to turning off the ghost prison? Also, why does Walter have such a hard-on for this place anyway? I understand he might be a zealous defender of the environment, but what led to this extreme? This is why Walter is a terrible one-dimensional villain. He has no motivation other than just being the movie's secondary antagonist so that all hell can break loose for the third act. How did the police get these barricades up so quickly? Only one or two of them showed up a few minutes ago to shut the place down and it just shut down. Why do all the spooks and specters shoot out all over the city like the tiny alien ships and close encounters of the third kind? They're all very specifically ghostly, as we'll soon see. So how are they all just blinky lights right when they're released? <laughs> this may be gross, but I don't think it actually violates any New York City health codes for street food vendors. <laughs> what? They were allowed to bring in these blueprints when they were taken to jail? Were they even searched at all? The whole building is a huge superconductive antenna that was designed and built expressly for the purpose of pulling in and concentrating spiritual turbulence. If this building is such a superconductor of spiritual turbulence, why did Lewis walk around New York aimlessly looking for the key master after he got possessed? Also, wouldn't Dana's apartment building have more ghost sightings? Or at least the surrounding area? The Ghostbusters have been running all over New York finding ghosts, and they haven't been concentrated around a small area. They conducted rituals up on the roof. Bizarre rituals intended to bring about the end of the world, and now it looks like it may actually happen. So they started this after World War I, and the ghosts just now started showing up? I guess I shouldn't be shocked, since a 60-year process is what management sells New York Jets season ticket holders every year. Rubberneckers. I know, there's a lot going on in the city, but this fucking building just had a big old explosion in the penthouse, and it's in a really well-populated area. No one from the police or fire department went up here to check this shit out. Lewis is the first one to the scene. What an incredible scene of destruction. Anyway, I'd like to point out that Dana's chair is completely intact after the demon hands completely rip it apart earlier. They use sense and nerve gases to induce hallucinations. People think they're seeing ghosts. This goes a long way to explaining, perhaps, why Walter hates the Ghostbusters so much. But is this what Walter sold the judge on to give him the court order? Just making stuff up? Everything was fine with our system until the power grid was shut off by Nicholas here. They caused an explosion. Is this true? Yes, it's true. This man has no d It's a classic for a reason, folks. Great setup to a great line. I'm going to remove five sins for it. Officially, the church will not take any position on the religious implications of these uh, phenomena. Catholicism. Dogs and cats living together. Mass hysteria. Jesus Christ, I love this movie. This is an objectively silly line, and therefore I have to sin it, but I do want to point out that they somehow made all these silly lines work in a way that no other film in this franchise has managed to do. What was the magic here? The script? The talent? The Murray? Wait. I'm still sending this line, right? God damn you, contractual obligation! Whoa, how did these sign-carrying assholes find this spot so quickly? And why did they? I mentioned the blowout earlier, but how would that bring a bunch of Bible thumpers to this exact spot? There are ghosts all over the city, right? Oh cool, they brought the National Guard. But why? Do they really need those folks to escort the ghosties down the street? Columbus Circle can get pretty crowded around rush hour, I know, but there are a lot of cops here that can take care of the traffic. Seriously, why even bring on a talented actor like Ernie Hudson if you're gonna put him here during the hero shot? The Ghostbusters fall into this massive hole in the street, and then a cop car falls into the hole. The earth moves even more while they're down there, and they survive this. Where are we? Based on the impossible height and improbably open staircase to this building, I'm guessing Hogwarts? Movie does not contain a hardcore sex scene with Sigourney Weaver and Rick Moranis. Also, wait, did they f Movie yada yada's that sh but based on their rampant randiness for each other and the disarray of the clothing, I'm pretty sure they f Why don't we ever talk about how they f If they were gonna just turn back into demon dogs when Gozer showed up, why'd they have to possess the humans in this building at all? Are you a god? How does Gozer not know this already? Doesn't it have some sort of god-smelling ability that all other gods have from all the different dimensions? It's kind of like saying, is this all beef to a New York City hot dog vendor? If you have to ask, you're going to be disappointed with the answer. Then... Yeah. Gozer shoots out this purple lightning recycled from the Emperor's dead fingers in Return of the Jedi and somehow doesn't have enough juice to knock them off the building or electrocute them. Ray, when someone asks you if you're a god, you say yes! F this movie is so f***ing great. We have the tools, we have the talent! Premature Gozerbration. 
All this heavy debris falls on this crowd and no one dies. Haven't you assholes seen what falling ice does to pedestrians in New York? Choose. Choose the form of the Destructor. Why does Gozer give the Ghostbusters a choice in what the Destructor is going to be? I guess it doesn't matter what it is, because it will be giant and it will want to destroy stuff because it's in the job title, but what if I thought of a giant pillow? You think a pillow is going to hurt New York? Whatever we think of, if we think of J. Edgar Hoover, J. Edgar Hoover will appear and destroy us, okay? So empty your heads! Somehow, after Peter says this, J. Edgar Hoover doesn't come to destroy them. How could you not think of the guy after his name was mentioned? Oh, sh in the middle of a comedy, Ivan Reitman manages to shoot this image of the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man in a way that's eerie and suspenseful, and then somehow easily transitions into being funny as well. It's tough to make something so ridiculous be so many things at once, but this movie did it. Why does the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man appear far away from the building where Gozer and the Ghostbusters are? All these supposedly seasoned New York residents freak the f*** out at the sight of the Jiggly Marshmallow Man, like they haven't seen hundreds of rogue cartoon balloons from the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade slide down this very route over the years. I know the special effects people were given very little time to finish, so this is why the shot of the buildings seem to separate from the rest of the background. Here's a sin for being in such a damn hurry, movie studios. We could reverse the particle flow through the gate. How? We'll cross the streets. I get what Egon is saying, but is the movie saying they've tried everything and this is their last chance? Because I haven't even seen them try to shoot the gate yet. The Stay Puft Marshmallow Man is pretty much cooked, so I'm wondering why Egon has the idea to cross the streams while shooting the gate when they haven't even tried shooting the gate normally yet. They only shot at Gozer a couple times and missed, so this idea seems to be coming from a let's get to the end of the movie already kind of place. The whole top of this building explodes and these guys don't even get injured. <laughs> What's this asshole even doing here? Oh, thank God. It's a nice joke that Peter doesn't get nearly the marshmallow goo on him that the others do. I'm still gonna sin it, because I hate fun. The fact that Dana and Lewis are merely encased in rock makes no sense, but hey, happy ending. I love this town! Me too! But of all the celebrations of this moment, why would Winston choose to shout out New York City? They didn't do shit to help defeat Gozer. Hell, he'd be better off shaking his fist, dropping his trousers, and spouting out, Boston makes me feel good! Oh, sh there's still a ghost problem in New York City even after all that. Were the other ghosts not related to all the Gozer stuff at all, or was that just a coincidence? I don't know, maybe couldn't hold his wad long enough. It's a common problem among middle-aged men.